Well, you did. See Terry coming in. Um, Stacy said she probably wouldn't be here. Saw her this morning. So we'll see who all else shows up. But Terry, okay. 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 it said I'd be on my way. Well, we. Did you? Like, there's nobody here to give you. I don't. Well, that's your fun. Like, oh, and her answer was, "I'm not a scary." That's perfectly. Uh, I think. I think. I agree with your shirt. Uh, you all need okay. Jesus. It's our own shirt. It's a shirt. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Bold and hurt is all good. Feeling better? Good. Feeling better ish. Well, good evening. Uh, glad we're we're here. We uh, begin with a prayer in a moment, and then walk through a handful of questions that we got from last week. We'll pray, Heavenly Father. We praise and thank you for the day that you've given to us. We ask you to continue to watch over us, especially as uh, we make our way uh, home this evening. Allow everyone to, to make it home safely or drive. Uh, while we are here, give us a full measure of your Holy Spirit that we might rejoice in uh, the, the wonderful work that you've given us uh, to do here in this world that you've created. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So we had some questions from last week. Uh, the One of the passages, one of the last passages we had last week uh, was uh, about from Matthew 10, are not two sparrows sold for a coin, yet not one of them will fall to the ground without the knowledge and consent of your father in heaven. And even the hairs of your head are all numbered. And so uh, my goal for the week is count the hairs on my head. That was 219. <laughs> that's, that's a little more than a little higher than I thought. <laughs> it's easier for some people. Yeah. All right. Uh, another question. Are the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Eden the same as the rivers today? So there's those four rivers listed in the Genesis account. The Tigris and Euphrates you can find on maps today. Are they the same? I don't know. Um, the flood happened. That much water is going to change some things a little bit. Um, but I think it's it seems likely. But I don't know. Um, how do we know that angels don't have souls? Do we really know that? So we talked last week about the distinction between soul and spirit and the way that soul is used. Uh, it is exclusively used in connection with the human being. So we have body and soul. God is spoken of as spirit. Angels are spoken of as spirit. But the word soul is never connected to them. Uh, when we talk about uh, our spirit as a, a human, that's usually in connection with either God, angels, devil, demons, with the spiritual world. Uh, so that's the distinction that uh, uh, is there in how those two words are used in scripture. Uh, and so what I said last week was that soul is this exclusively human thing. Now, this question, do we really know that angels don't have souls? I guess we don't. Uh, there, there's a lot we don't know, but there's nothing in the use of the word soul that uh, ever hints at that possibility. But it's got to be left probably ultimately as an unanswered question. So, but soul, 
usually tied only to uh, the human being. Uh, will the devil have access us access to us in heaven? Um, in Job chapter one, uh, the devil is brought before God in his throne room. Uh, and God says, where, where have you been going? Uh, he's out wandering throughout the earth. You know, he's this exhausted. Uh, the Peter uses the, the idea of a lion. He's like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That roar that uh, is talked about in the New Testament, it's a particular type of roar. This is not the roar of a strong, healthy lion, but of a famished, dying lion. So it's a particular type of roar. And you see that as he's talking with God in the throne room uh, in Job chapter one, uh, that he's he's exhausted going back and forth throughout the, the earth. Um, there's that connection that where the devil gets to be in the presence of God there uh, in Job. Jesus talks about Satan asking to sift Peter as wheat because Satan is... Uh, one who is an angel created by God uh, who fell. And so now uh, in his fallen uh, you know, uh, punishment, uh, he can only go so far. He can't do whatever he wants. Uh, he's got to ask permission how far he can go. So there's communication between God and Satan. There's nothing, uh, it, it seems, in Job uh, that there's any communication between Satan and the saints who are in heaven. Uh, all of the angels are brought before God. Um, he's the commander, the Lord of armies. Uh, he's the general, uh, and they have to answer to him, including Satan. But the believers who are in heaven are not in that picture at all. So what will it be like for us? Will we ever see him going into the throne room? You know, uh, to, you know, to listen to God and, and for God to say, well, well, what about Stan? You know, have you considered him? Um, not a pleasant thing, um, but, you know, God, you know, terrifying. But would we see that? I don't, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I don't kind of think so, uh, but he's definitely not going to have access to us, right? Um, he can tempt us now, but we are safe in Christ now, and we will be safe in Christ then. Um, thinking about the, the devil and demons, the, what the scriptures help us know is all that we need to know. We don't want to get too interested in the devil and demons. Um, what we know is that they have lost. Jesus wins and we're safe in Christ. Uh, if you're walking down the street and there's a, a chain link fence uh, surrounding a front yard uh, and there are 15 signs, beware dog, don't jump the fence um, the devil and demons exist. They'll come if you ask them to come in. You go looking for them, open yourself up to them. Um, it's a dangerous game to play. Um, but you, dear baptized children of God, you're safe in Christ. You don't have to be afraid of the devil or the demons. But don't think you're strong enough to take them on. You know, uh, don't go picking a fight with that. Stay in Christ. Say your prayers. Read the Bible. Sing Jesus loves me. The devil can't stand that. Uh, you have to run away. Um, so you're safe in Christ. Uh, can you provide more information on the tree of life? So the tree of life is brought up in Genesis. Uh, and Adam and his dear bride were sent away from that after they sinned so that they wouldn't eat from that and live forever as people who were dying and decaying. Um, I don't want to live for 
thousands and thousands of years in this life. Um, I really would rather not make it to a hundred. Um, uh, but uh, that tree of life was barred. The tree of life comes up again in uh, Revelation 22 as part of the picture of heaven. It's got these uh, fruits uh, that it's bearing uh, every month. And so 12 uh, times of harvest. Like every month, there's it's just always fruitful. Uh, and it's called a tree of life. And the word for tree there in Revelation is the same word for tree that we read in uh, Bible class this last Sunday. Uh, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Uh, it's a unique word for a tree. Uh, and that that tree of the cross, uh, use the same word for the tree of life, uh, is not surprising. Um, for us, the tree of life here on earth is the cross of Christ. This is how we get eternal life. This is how we get access uh, to uh, heaven, to that tree of life, whatever that's going to be like. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Revelation language, as someone I talked to last, uh, just on Tuesday, he, he said, well, it's kind of revelation-y. Um, you know, like, well, what, sometimes we just don't know what to do with it. It's a little revelation-y sometimes. Um, the tree of life uh, in heaven, what exactly that's going to be like, um, it, it's hard to say. But for us right now, to know Christ and him crucified, you know, that he bore our sins in his body on that tree, um, that's why we know we're going to live forever. Okay. Uh, does that bring up anything, these uh, handful of questions? We didn't have any to hold off on for a later lesson this week. Dawn? You probably answered this last week, but um, sorry, I know it's my question. What do you think the time frame was from uh, from the creation that they sent? Okay. Yeah, we, time frame. yeah we did bring that uh, that one up last week. And so how long did it take from, so uh, the Friday, that first Friday, the sixth day, God creates uh, Adam uh, and creates his bride and, and says, this is very good on the seventh day, he rests. Um, after that first week, how long did it take uh, until they sinned? I don't know, this is part of the, it's a big part of the answer. Probably not long. Another part of the answer, because God said, be fruitful and multiply. And we don't hear about conception until after we fall into sin. So probably not long. Um, and that that's the most that I could probably say. A lot of uh, theologians in the early, early Christian church uh, picked up on the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, especially the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as the altar. Like this is the place where they got to sacrifice. Uh, in a world where there was no death, there was still the worship of sacrifice that they could say no to themselves uh, in a, a way of trusting God. And so the uh, Israelites, uh, through the Levitical priesthood, to take your first troops, to take the, the healthiest lamb, and, and to say, I trust you, God, and give that up. Uh, to say no to taking what I, I, you know, taking something for myself and give it up. They got to do that, uh, you know, with without blood, uh, without any pain or anything like that, uh, by just not eating. So this was their altar. So what a lot of early Christian uh, writers, uh, and Martin Luther included, uh, would do, ended up doing was uh, Sunday morning, they went to church. And a first church service, a false preacher slithered out, and they they sinned that. So they, there's a lot of people that say, well, it was it was probably that first Sunday morning. I mean, I mean, the devil wasn't going to waste any time, but that's all, you know. I I don't know. Um, I I do think it's helpful to think about that as their church and that as their worship. And here's the altar, and here's where they get to uh, show their trust in God in a world that has no problems, that they get to say, I'm not going to touch that because I trust you. Um, 
and then thinking about the the devil as a false creature of course you know he, he certainly is comes in and lies and um so what do you think i i was just curious <laughs> yeah i mean wonder what the time for uh you know we're living in 900 years old so i uh, yeah diff- what yeah. that she bore her children before then and then i came along so I, I mean, Bible is not period. Yeah, the Bible the is not a full, complete record of absolutely everything that happened then. So the, there's a lot of oh, so where did where did this come from? That come from? Um, when I was in fourth grade, I tried to convince my uh, teacher uh, that it, it could have been like four thousand years um, that it didn't happen. You know, uh, that they were living in perfection. Um, and she said, "No, like, God told them to be fruitful and multiply." They're not going to wait 4,000 years to do that. And then I said something smart out, grab a table or something like that. But um, probably not long is, I think, the best thing we can say there. Okay, Um, we're going to be on top of page 17 uh, in our handout. We're thinking about God, the Father, uh, as the creator of a beautiful creation. And he's made us, our identity, Uh, is as the crown of his beautiful creation. And our purpose is the caretaker of this beautiful creation. So everything that we see, everything that we do not see, God has made. And after that first week, he said, this is very good. Uh, And he told Adam uh, and his bride to take care. Uh, If this is all his... That should change how we view it and what we do with it. So there are three words that I want us to keep in mind as we take a look at the passages on page 17. Um, There's the word humble. There's the word grateful. And there's the word service. Humble, grateful service. If you are entrusted with someone else's stuff, if you're taking care of someone else's family, uh, someone else's house, uh, you don't approach that with with arrogance or pride. That's going to be a problem. Uh, Humility. Uh, if someone has given you the, the keys to, to, to their house and said, you know, this is yours for all the whole summer, uh, use whatever, take care of it. Um, but, you know, everything that's in the fridge is yours. Um, you just call and it'll be paid for. We'll get it restocked. You know, the, the uh, pool is open. Uh, we got a guy that's coming in to clean it. You know, we just want you to, we just need someone in the house throughout the summer while we're gone. Um you just live here. Enjoy it. Should be grateful. Um, what a wonderful thing uh, to open up the fridge there and say, oh, I don't have any money. Um, and, you know, start complaining uh, to uh, to say they should have given me more to be greedy. Um, you know, that that's a problem. That's a problem. Um, to take this up as as service. Uh, to to live in this world uh, in service to God uh, rather than in like total domination. Like I'm going to impose my will uh, on the animals here, on the people here. Uh, I'm going to rearrange all of the furniture uh, and, you know, put my spin on it. Uh, Let this be my thing. Um, Completely different uh, ways of going about making use of something that someone else has given to you as a pure gift. So we want to, in our purpose as caretakers of God's beautiful creation, to remain humble, grateful, be mindful of our service. So with these three words especially in mind, let's take a look at some passages. At the top of page 17, the Lord God took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. 
he's supposed to do for it uh, what uh, ultimately is a, a God thing to do. Talked about the difference between image and uh, likeness uh, last week. And an image uh, sometimes is that word is used for idols, false idols uh, that would represent the false God. We're supposed to be made in his image to be his like representatives. God takes care of all of creation. We get to do it too. God provides for children. We get to do it. Too. God protects. We get to do it too. Always on a smaller scale, but we get to act like God in a small way. And God put Adam in the Garden of Eden to take care of it. This is his garden. And God says to Adam, here you go. Here are the keys. Uh, this is where the shovel is, you know, well, here, take care of it. The uh, spirit in which we would take care of uh, all of creation, uh, the, the people in it, the stuff in it, the animals in it, uh, is uh, in connection with the summary of the law, uh, which you see in Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So humility and service uh, in these two especially. Uh, that uh, I, I am mindful of the Lord God uh, and what he has given me, which makes me grateful and fuels my service for everything else that he has made, especially the other people that he has created. Um, I, as the individual, am not the crown of God's creation and the rest of you slums, you know, you, you, you know, you're getting in my way for, you know, my glory. No, mankind is the crown of God's creation. Every human being that you see, uh, God thinks pretty highly of to have created and to have become a man and died for. Uh, that should create some humility. That should fuel uh, my love for them. Uh, how can I repay the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup, cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord who will fulfill my vows uh, to the Lord now in his presence, uh, in the presence of all his people. Uh, this is a remarkable thing. How am I going to uh, repay the Lord for everything he's given to me, all his benefits? What's the first thing that he says? I'm going to take more. Uh, this is one of the uh, great things that we get to do uh, in showing thanks. Uh, when you're at grandma's house uh, and she puts uh, a meal before you and you finish your plate, uh, it's good to say thank you with your words. It's fine later you know, in the week to write a thank you note and put it in the meal. But one of the best things you can do is get seconds. <laughs> Take more of this stuff because God is a giver of gifts. Uh, and one of the ways that we uh, show our gratitude is to enjoy this stuff. You know, go out and just sit in the sun uh, and marvel at that and stare at the clouds and smell the flowers and uh, eat the bacon and all of the good. It's just enjoy the good stuff that God has made. Um, and especially uh, with this passage, uh, which becomes a prayer in the New Testament uh, church. Uh, it's a long-standing tradition in the uh, in the church to use this as part of your prayer uh, it, before receiving the blood of Christ in the Holy Communion. Uh, what will I render to the Lord uh, for all of his benefits to me? I will take up the cup of salvation. And thus will I be saved from my enemies. It's one of the, the ways that that prayer goes. Um, so I take the good things that he offers. Uh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel say now, yes, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say now, yes, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say now, yes, his mercy endures forever. Uh, two things that happen in there that we are uh, saying things, we're grateful, but that we're also proclaiming that, which is a wonderful service to, to other people. Uh, that we proclaim that his mercy endures forever. We say this, uh, and you have the word, say now, say now, say now. And the psalm goes on with more of that. 
that we actually say this out loud uh, so that other people know his mercy endures forever. This is one of the best ways that we uh, can serve other human beings uh, is by proclaiming the mercy for The next passage is from Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. In fact, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. After all, what will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what can a person give in exchange for his soul? So let him deny himself, which for us in, in the New Testament uh, time and in a, a uh, well in the a world that has fallen and is there's the sin uh, for me to deny myself uh, is a part of uh, you know fighting against the temptation of sin. But as we were talking about before, Adam and his bride they got to deny themselves. Uh, here's the, the tree of the, the knowledge of good and evil, and they got to say no to themselves. Even in a perfect world, it's a healthy thing for human beings to say no to themselves. Uh, and it's a pretty vital thing. For when Adam and his bride did not say no to self, <clears throat> now we all die. And that's kind of a problem. Um, for us, this is a vital thing uh, in uh, our relationship with God and in our relationship with one another. That if I'm capable of saying no to myself, then I have one of the best tools for, you know, a relationship between a husband and wife. Um, that if, if I can never say no to myself, uh, then my bride is always, uh, is very often going to be an obstacle to me getting what I want. Um, but if I learn to say no to myself, uh, then I can love my bride. Uh, I can give up all for her. Uh, and there's kind of there's about nothing that she can do on a day-to-day -day basis that's uh, really going to get in my way of loving her the way that Christ loved the church. Um, which then brings me total freedom. This is the, the upside-down way that it works. You know, Jesus talks about uh, losing life uh, in order to save it. Um, but whoever wants to save his life is going to lose it. Uh, and if I'm going to deny myself, that seems like I'm harming my own freedom, but it actually brings total freedom. We had a, on Sunday about the you know, to be last and servant of all. Which means you can do that anywhere, anytime. Uh, if you're the boss, you can be the servant of all. Uh, if you're the lowest man on the totem pole, you can be the servant of all. Um, if all uh, your goal is, is to be in Christ, uh, then like no one can get in your way. You're completely free. And so if self-denial is a crucial part of your daily life, uh, then the only, the only obstacle to that is yourself. I don't know, because uh, myself doesn't want to be denied. Um, but if I can deny myself, then I can try to actually love everyone around me. Not that it's ever going to be easy or nice or pleasant, um, but no one can get in the way of me bringing glory to uh, God and keeping his name holy if that's the goal. We'll keep unpacking that. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit and having one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility consider one another better than yourselves. Let each of you look carefully not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Again, in humility, that second to last line there, about in the middle, in humility, consider one another better than yourselves. Um, what can anyone do to keep you from doing this? 
Uh, in humility, consider one another better than yourselves. And my how that uh, ends arguments, uh, if, if the person I'm talking to is up here uh, rather than down here, you know, when I'm right uh, about how the dishes ought to be done, uh, then everyone else is getting in the way of my glorious uh, way of uh, filling the, the dishwasher, which is the only right way. And all of these, all of these little minions uh, in the house, they're just getting in the way. Oh, goodness. Um, but if these little ones even that are physically down there, if I'm thinking about them as up here, um, they're better than uh, I get to serve them. Changes the way I'm going to talk to them if they're up here. I don't know if you've noticed that uh, with with uh, other human beings. Uh, if I ha I, my sisters are shorter than I am. Uh, there's uh, some people down in Georgia that I met straight out of the seminary, I, and were very kind to me and acted like uh, older brothers and older sisters. And they're shorter than I am. Uh, but it wasn't uh, uh, until I was probably like 29 or so that I kind of realized like, oh, I'm taller than you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember vividly with uh, one uh, lady down in, in Georgia who kind of was like a big sister, you know, they had me over as a single pastor over to dinner all of the time and checking in, checking in. And uh, we were at the school uh, for that our church had uh, and uh, by the copy machine. And I realized like, I'm like three inches tall. I, I've always thought you were like taller than you. Um, I don't know if that, that sort of thing has happened that as a relationship grows uh, with, with someone else that You've always like looked up to them to the point where like you didn't realize that and kind of, you're kind of short. I didn't know this that. Um, but it was a striking thing, and I can still remember exactly you know, all of the details of that uh, little moment uh, that it was, oh, this person who has been so good to me. Uh, you know, I'm this little idiot and coming out of school that doesn't know anything. Uh, and just been like, not demeaning to me ever, but like a nice, kind older sister. I uh, and and then all of a sudden I realized like physically I'm taller than you. It was a strange thing. Um, and I think this is you know, in humility, consider one another better than yourselves. And I've had it the other way too. My little brother is way taller than. I spent a lot of time looking down on him for like not not just like older brother stuff, but like bad reasons. Because like, I'm I'm right, uh, and and between uh, you know me and my siblings, it was it was usually my little uh, where it was like I'm right. Like if there's someone that I'm gonna you know prove you know get into an argument with, it was always going to be him. And it's shameful. Um, and then you realize, first of all, I'm way taller. Um, but then you see him as a uh, as a husband and as a father, and and God, we really need to start looking up to this guy and uh, learning from him. Um, and so, both directions and straight. Interesting that it worked out that physically, um, he actually is taller than I am. But this is what we're supposed to do and how that changes just about everything. Uh, when in humility, consider one another better than yourselves. And how it changes everything when in pride, you consider yourself better than someone else. So much of my... Uh, shame and regrets looking back on life uh, are kind of directed towards my little brother. Uh, and some of the things I said and did that just 
came out of this and looking down on it. I, and I, it's awful. And I want the opposite uh, for me, for you, uh, because this is a beautiful thing. And humility to consider one another better than you. Matthew 20. But Jesus summoned them and said, You know that the rulers of the nations lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But uh, it will not be that way among you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you will be your slave just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for men. This is what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. We have failed in this. We have often been over here. And even if it has only been once in our life that we've been over here instead of over here, it's enough. You know, one uh, stumbling point is enough to for make us guilty of the whole law. But our Lord Jesus Christ has done this. Uh, he who uh, could have uh, come to be served, deserved it, did not come to be served, but to serve. To give his life as a ransom for many. And through faith in Christ, his perfection in humility, gratitude, service uh, is credited to your account. Uh, so God the Father is uh, not disappointed with the way that I treated my little brother. He's not disappointed in me, because that's covered in blood. You can see how mixed up the disciples were, like when you started washing their feet. You know, like, wait a second. I, you know, I should be washing your feet. Yeah. But Jesus you know, is making the point to them and showing what true humility was and service and everything. But you can see how in their head they're like, what's going on? This is all backwards here. What's going on? Yeah. And thick skulls take a little time to, to get through. Uh, the, the same, that same uh, uh, thing that he's teaching in such a visual way as he's washing their feet. Um, here in Matthew 20, uh, earlier, like we heard uh, on Sunday with, you know, bringing the child in. And uh, so uh, there's multiple times that he's putting this out there. Uh, and and then the whole history of the Christian church and, you know, the, the fights over uh, church authority uh, that we still don't really get it. You know, we, we mess this up and we mess this up and mess this up. But thanks be to God, you know, the Son of Man fulfilled it for it. Now, when we are humble, grateful, uh, and uh, people of, of service, then we... This prayer, hallowed be thy name, it happens. When this happens, uh, pride and you know, greedy uh, and domination, uh, we desecrate God's name. We don't keep it holy. Uh, we drag it through the mud. In the prayer that our Lord has taught us, he prays, uh, he teaches us to pray to our Father uh, who art in heaven. In the small catechism, we have this explanation. And with these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true father and we are his true children, so that we may pray to him as boldly and confidently as dear children ask their dear father. The first thing he teaches us to pray for is all of this. Hallowed be thy name. What does this mean? God's name is certainly holy by itself, but we pray in this petition that we too may keep it holy. How is God's name kept holy? God's name is kept holy when his word is taught in its truth and purity, and we as children of God lead holy lives according to it. Help us to do this, dear Father in heaven. But whoever teaches and lives contrary to God's word dishonors God's name among us. Keep us from doing this, dear Father in heaven. Now, how we live uh, here on earth uh, as God's children uh, in humility, gratitude to God, and in service uh, to God and to our neighbor. Uh, well, we have that laid out for us uh, in the commandments. We have a few commandments at the top of page 18. The first, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. Uh, and we'll think about these uh, in connection with what uh, we call the two tables of the law. So on the illustration there uh, on page 18, 
uh, we've got the first table of the law is about this. Uh, it's about loving, uh, loving God. So love God, we call that the first table of the law. And that has to do with commandments one through three uh, as in the way that we order or, or number the commandments. There's some disagreements about how the commandments are numbered and we're allowed to have disagreements um, God in Deuteronomy does say that there's 10, uh, but he doesn't say this is one, this is two, this is three. Um, we can disagree about that. But the first table is all about uh, this uh, relationship, that we would love God. And the second table is that we would love neighbor. So we would love all of the people uh, that God has given to us. So four through 10 uh, in the second table of the law. Now, if we're thinking about uh, the relationships that we have with other people, um, we have to be mindful of God in all of them. Uh, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So that means when I'm uh, loving my wife, well, what does Paul say? Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. So I'm mindful of God in that relationship between uh, me and my wife. Uh, I don't love her because she's lovable. If that's the case, then we're on rocky ground. And she doesn't love me because I'm lovable. In that case, we're on really rocky ground. Um, it's uncertain if the love depends on me and her. Mindful of Christ, who loves Rachel and wants her to be loved in a variety of ways, he is, I have been chosen by God to be the one to love her as a husband. So this is a calling from God. And so if my feelings go against this calling from God, then my feelings be damned, right? Um, if I'm not you know, into it today and I don't want to listen to her because uh, I'm uh, a little grouchy and I didn't sleep well last night and I just don't want to deal with it. All of that be damned. This is not about my feelings first. Uh, God has chosen me to be her husband. And so I get to love her the way that Christ loved the church. That's where I start. And when I do that, then I realize, you know what? Um, those feelings are from my sinful nature and they're never helpful. Uh, and when I deny myself, uh, then, you know, there's all of these wonderful feelings that come that are what a fantastic gift from God. And especially on those days when I don't feel like being a good husband, if I get over myself and love her anyway, then the feelings are something completely different, something so much better. Uh, so uh, being mindful of God in all of these relationships, uh, that's why the first commandment is, is first. Um, the fourth commandment begins what we call the second table of the law and has to do with our first relationship. Now, honor your father and mother. Now, what does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not dishonor or anger our parents and others in authority, but honor, serve, and obey them, and give them love and respect. Uh, that happens. Uh, so if, if this is me uh, down here uh, next to my bride, uh, and there are people above me uh, in the state. There are people above me in the church. There are people above me uh, at in the family relationship at home, uh, not in uh, my home, uh, in my particular family. But I got mom and dad uh, still alive, uh, and uh, I, I don't live with them currently. Uh, but there are people that God has put above me. Uh, and what I do to them, I'm also doing to the triune God who put them above me. 
Is there any time then that I can disobey the authority at home, church, or in the state? Because if I rebel against authority here, rebelling against God, if I honor, serve, obey, honoring, serving, obeying God. So is there any time that I can disobey this authority here that's in between me and God. Seems like contrary to God's word. So if this guy tells me to disobey the one true God, then I say no. We obey God rather than God. If this guy tells me to do something that's not sinful, but I don't think it's the wise worthwhile. Uh, hopefully I can talk to them. We can discuss this a little bit. Maybe there's a different way of doing this. But ultimately, uh, to disobey this one, if he's not telling me to disobey this one, would mean that I am disobeying. So uh, Friday's coming. Uh, there's usually a lot of red shirts worn on Friday. Um, if that's a mandate from, uh, you know, the, uh, the governor or the mayor or whoever it might be, that this has to happen. If it doesn't happen, you're going to get arrested. We say that's a little overboard, you know. Uh, that's probably uh, a bit of uh, you're overreaching, uh, you know, what you should be doing. Your job is to prevent total chaos, not to tell us what to wear. You can say, well, it's a Red Friday, um, and but, you know, ultimately do whatever you want. That's probably a wiser thing to do. But if you say, like, if, if you're not wearing red, we're going to arrest you. You're not asking us to sin. Well, guess what? We're red. And vote, uh, you know, you out <laughs> because that's ridiculous. Uh, and we'll, you know, show up to uh, town balls and we'll talk about this, which is something we can do here. Uh, and if uh, mom or dad at home is being kind of uh, illogical and unreasonable, we could talk about it. But ultimately, if the authority above me is not telling me to disobey God, uh, I submit. It's tough, but um, it's honor to God uh, to obey. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. Uh, what does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and befriend him in every bodily need. Uh, so this uh, has to do with the passage we spent some time with uh, on the other side. Now, this is where I want to view myself. Uh, in humility, I think about others as greater than me. Uh, so if they're greater than me, uh, then I'm not going to harm them. Not going, certainly not going to end their life. And these are people that I feel privileged to be in the presence of. And whatever the relationship is, uh, I get to serve them, not try to harm them, make life difficult for them. Uh, God protects the gift of life there. And he protects uh, the gift of life uh, for uh, unborn babies. Uh, which, when thinking through uh, things like like abortion, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, if you are a hundred years old, you make your way. Think about the the changes uh, in in someone's life from a hundred back to when they were eighty to sixty, all the way back, uh, all the way back uh, to the time of conception. The differences, the changes, uh, uh, really come down to um, the uh, location of the human and the stage of development of the human. Uh, I, if I meet someone who's a uh, hundred years old, I can look at them and say that you know they, they might be about a hundred years old. I look at someone who's uh, about you know twenty five. That seems about right, about 25. 
Um, there is uh, this uh, development that happens and uh, changes that, that occur within uh, someone's, someone's life. Uh, and most of that life is outside of the will. Um, when you go all the way down to uh, two minutes out of side of mom and two minutes uh, before being outside of mom, there's really not much difference in development between those four, four minutes change. Uh, if you keep going back within those months within the womb, it's all just changes in different stages of development. The biggest change is at that moment of conception, when now there is a unique DNA. And that child has everything within that genetic code and all of that to be able to develop. Um, maybe not everything will develop same way for everyone. This one that has been conceived might develop and have uh, 12 fingers or develop and not be able to hear. Not ever, all of the development is going to go as planned. Maybe there will be a time without anyone from outside doing anything well, where the child will die. Um, so I'm one, of, I'm one of seven children and only six were born. You know? Uh, the development might be stopped for any number of things that happen. The fifth commandment is about, it's not our place to cause that, to end that. Uh, whether, whether she's 99 years old or 39 years old or 14 weeks along, you know, it's not my place to end that development with death. Our lives are not our lives, they're God's. And in a mysterious, mysterious way where he doesn't give us answers, sometimes he stops a life really, really young. And sometimes, like Henrietta, just just shy of a hundred. I'm pretty close, a lot closer than I want to get. <laughs> but it's not my, it's not my choice. It's his. He has given part of that authority over life to the government, as he's given the government the sword. Uh, in order to prevent total chaos. And there are some men who have done such wicked things that the government should kill them. The, the, the death penalty needs to, it can't be quick. We need to have appeals, 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 you know, take time. But there's some guys that have done some stuff that they just, they just need to be put to death. We don't need to waste any money in feeding them anymore. They need to die. Um, that's a difficult position to be in, uh, to be to be soldier and to take someone else's life in your hand. Um, it's a difficult position to be in, but it's good. It's honorable. Um, it's that image of God. Uh, thing that we were talking about last week and again this week, that there's things that God does. We get to do it on a smaller scale. One of the difficult things that God does is end life. He gives and he takes away. And there are some in the government, military, who have the sword and have that authority. But you and I don't, and medical professionals don't. Um, God wants to protect life. Um, there's a lot of difficult situations within the womb. And, and, but most of the reasons for that people give for abortion are it's just no, it's 
it's not the humble uh, stuff. It's the pride and the greed and the, you know, this is my life uh, and playing God kind of stuff. I'll stop there. I heard the I'm a well, maybe last week. Uh, the radio guy. Well, it's been 15 years, like a, not a lifetime, that Roe v. Wade was in effect. And so uh, 50 years ago to 50 years, that's a long time that that has been going on, that people grew up like that, and that's okay, because they don't know any different. So okay. that was kind of sad to me. Yeah, it, it's the uh, uh, only thing in, in my lifetime. Yeah. Wow. The, yeah. uh, the advancements in what we have found out about what's going on within the womb uh, during that time uh, are, are things that ought to be shared. Uh, with, with people, you know, what, what's going on it's at, at 11 weeks, at five weeks, you know, uh, we, we know so much more than we've ever known before. And it's, um, it's hard to say that, that, that person's not a person, you know, any more than, you know, you can go to some places where you're visiting people who are way on the other end of the spectrum and there's not there's there's not much conversation that's happening anymore. There's a lot of drooling. Uh, and there's uh, you know, there's no laughing or anything. Um, but there's there's no way that you can say that's not a person. Um, and a person on either end of the spectrum uh, who's not able to do anything for themselves and therefore is more worthy of our protection. Um, you know, then us in the middle of uh, we do a lot for ourselves already. Other thoughts on uh, that's not the the difficult topic. Um, want to hear from you? If you have anything? Whether you're writing it down on a yellow sheet um, or you know raising your hand, um, listen to part of a a good podcast between um, a pro-choice uh, midwife and a pro-life uh, doctor, uh, and the two of these ladies talking for an hour and a half about it, uh, and. Lots of lots of stuff I didn't know, lots of helpful information, and the the point was made pretty well. I think that there's there's just not a uh, never really a reason for a medical medically necessary abortion. And you know, young men saying, you know, I was. Uh, I'm a triplet and I'm the I'm the one that the doctor said, you know, abort that one uh, so that you, mom, can live. Um, and here I am, 22, mom said no. Um, I'm glad she said no. The, the, the amount of information we have about you know, what's going on there and it, uh, it's just harder and harder to, to say, well, well, who's to say? Well, that's pretty clear. Pretty clear. Okay. A radio guy, Rush Limbaugh, Rush Limbaugh several, it's been several years ago, one of the callers, lady called in, was already working about this. <clears throat> said, it's my choice. I want to be pregnant. And he said, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I just want you to make that choice before you get pregnant. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty hard. Yeah. Especially the comedy for people. To yeah. The, 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 and it's a hard thing to, to say. And um, and then brings up difficult situations. Well, what if it wasn't my choice? Yeah. Uh, you know, rape. it's rape and incest. And, and the, well, it's like, yeah. I've heard that is. 
you're killing the child for the crime of the father. Yeah, the, the father is the guy that probably should be castrated. Yeah. I mean, that's probably not uh, something that our country is ever going to do as a punishment, but I think it's worth being on sons, the table. So I had a daughter who was raped and the pregnancy resulted. I, I don't know how I would handle yeah. myself. I mean, that's got to be a terrible situation. Yeah. Horrific. Yeah. And babies are awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and here's here's this baby uh, that, that can be cared for, that can be loved. And the the regret uh, that uh, haunts uh, those who have gone through with an abortion and the things that they can hear in the middle of the night decades later um, because... Yeah. Um, Little bones being chopped up and that sort of sound. Um, the the evil of a human being, you know, a, a man who has raped a woman. Um, punishment doesn't need to be handed out to to a baby. Um, a stricter punishment should be handed out, you know, to those men who have done evil things. There's yellow sheets around, and um, if uh, we could pass those along, maybe maybe every yellow sheet will have a question about abortions. It's, um, it's the it's a tough it's a tough thing um, to to talk about. Um, the drug chemicals that they use. Men in prison who do get with a gastric them publicly is the same drug that they're giving little boys that are wanting to go through the gender transition. Yeah. They're getting the demonstration in some cases. Yeah, it is. That's, um, and the, the advancement in uh in medication you know, that has happened over the last hundred years, but then we also are starting. We keep finding out. Well, we, we gave uh, women this uh, to help them with that, and but now you know this is the problem uh, that that has come from it. You know, even when it's not something with medical castration, but uh, you know, yeah. what are we doing to ourselves? Um, I throw up my hands a lot of times. Um, but God is for our bodies uh, and our life uh, and for babies. Um, and there is a striking difference between uh, the Lord Jesus Christ who says, take and eat, this is my body given for you. My body for you. And the Satan's sacrament of you know, my body, my choice. Let's destroy. Um, let's destroy uh, conception. Uh, the whatever has been conceived, because at the very beginning, you know, when uh, Adam and Eve fell, God said to the serpent, um, "I will put off uh, enmity between your." seed and her seed and her seed will crush your head so the, the verbiage there in the hebrew is very uh gritty and sexual and is it's her semen and it's right there in the womb uh, and at that moment of conception uh, that he's talking about you know we we clean up the language in our English translations because we're still uh, we're still Puritans. Um, but what he said, you know, uh, her semen, which she doesn't have, unless there's conception, um, he will crush your head. The devil hates conception. The devil hates babies. He always has, and he's always going. Uh, and he loves 
the death of babies. And what a striking difference between, you know, my body, my choice, and the Lord Jesus is, it's my body given. And the forgiveness of your son. And he is that seed. Uh, it's a striking thing that, you know, she she doesn't have seed. Um, and the virgin should not be able to conceive. Uh, but the, the word through whom all things uh, were made and for whom all things exist um, became flesh in her womb. And that moment, this striking moment, uh, it's there in Luke chapter one, this angel Gabriel comes to the Blessed Virgin. And that's what the devil hates. Uh, and that's our salvation. Which is why, you know, Mary would say, you know, all, all generations will call me blessed. And stop it. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much.